Morning Comets. You're listening to Radio UTD. Welcome to the Research Showcase Poster Competition. Throughout today's show, you'll be able to participate in several interactive polls and activities, including voting for your favorite finalist. Grab your cell phone and follow along with me as we go over the instructions on how you can participate in today's show using Poll Everywhere. Step one. Open the texting app on your smartphone and start a new text. Step two, enter 37607 in the two section. Step three, enter UTD research 004, where you type a new text message, then hit send. Remember, message and data rates may apply. Step four, wait for it. Wait for it. You will receive a response back from Poll Everywhere that looks like this. Congratulations! You successfully joined the Poll Everywhere for this event. You are now ready to participate in the activities and vote for your favorite finalist at the end of the show. So keep your cell phone close and get ready to vote. We will begin the Research Showcase Poster Competition after a word from our sponsor. Every day, people get up and get ready for an ordinary day. But here at UT Dallas, our days are beyond ordinary. 50 years ago, our innovations and experiments helped with NASA's history-making missions. And in the years since, we've become one of the fastest growing universities and one of the brightest stars in Texas. As a tier one institution, we are all about the doing that makes innovation possible. And thanks to those innovations, children are given the miracle of hearing. 
Cancer detection and treatment are being transformed. Robotics are shaping the future for surgical procedures. Big ideas are becoming businesses, and art is bringing cultures together. We didn't build this, all of this, in 50 years. Instead, we did it at the speed of bright. Welcome to the 2020 Research Showcase Poster Competition! Our fierce competitors in round one were Philip Eggers, Catherine White Austin, Natalia DeSantos, Anna Epps, Catherine Garner, Keith Ryder, Jacob Lakovic, Lynn Liu, Shruthi Ravi, Lily Rollins, Evan Smith, and Mackenzie Taylor. On today's show, our finalists, Deborah Calderon, Adrian DeFoy, Robert Morrison, Olga Pescova, and Monica Trevino. You are all members of our live studio audience. So get ready to vote for your favorite contestant at the end of our show. Now take it away, Dr. Pancrazio. Welcome. It's great to have everyone here. My name is Joe Pancrazio. I serve as Vice President for Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. And it is truly my privilege to welcome you to our Summer 2020 Research Showcase Poster Competition, which is coming to you live from the North Dallas area in the great state of Texas. Today, we'll be featuring outstanding young scientists at UT Dallas who are from our School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. We call it BBS. The mission of BBS is to study the biology and psychology of thought and language, development and aging, social interaction and perception, both in health and disease. BBS is by far one of the most unique schools, not just in Texas or the United States, but in the world. Joining us for this event are faculty, students, and alumni from BBS. And very importantly, you are viewing audience from all over the world. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, as you've just heard, each of today's five contestants is a PhD student. We are proud of each of them as we are of those who were part of the earlier phase of the, con of the contest and are more than 1,500 doctoral students at UT Dallas. We know that our research success as a university is directly tied to the outstanding graduate students who join us from all over the globe. Now, this event is important because it's not just about science. It's about the ability to communicate complex science and findings to a general audience, you. Uh, now, we live in a time when social media makes it difficult to separate fact from opinion and fiction. So it's never been more important for our world to have scientists who can not only conduct state-of-the-art research and push the frontier, but also communicate it effectively to the public. And that's what we're seeking to really recognize here today. Now, uh, as you've just heard, the viewing audience plays an important active role. You'll be casting your vote to determine who will be crowned our champion. You'll be able to vote live in real time via text messaging for your favorite finalist. So uh, today is the culminating event uh, for a process that started with a preliminary round of competition with those wonderful students you just saw featured earlier. It's based on video submissions from 17 contestants. We had a team of 18 judges that selected our top five finalists who you'll hear from today. Now, helping us to evaluate each of the contestants are our panel of celebrity judges. We have Dr. Stephen Small, who's the Dean of the School of Behavioral Brain Sciences, BBS. We have a, a, an alumna from BBS, Ms. Nicole Tucker, and we're fortunate to have our Dean of Graduate Education, Dr. Juan Gonzalez. Now, my legal team and the Office of Research has asked that I tell everyone here the following, so listen up. Any resemblance of this production to actual persons, events, or popular American TV shows like American Idol is purely, entirely, and completely coincidental. Well, sort of. So, before I turn the event over to our MC, uh, who's a faculty member in BBS, Dr. Andrea Warner Sis. Um, let me wish our contestants good luck and ask, are you in it to win it? I hope you are. So take it away, Andrea. Thank you, Dr. Pancrazio. I'm your host, Andrea Warner Sis, and this is the Research Showcase Poster Competition, sponsored by the Office of Research. 
This event showcases the outstanding work of our graduate students in behavioral and brain sciences. And we're going to start by running this like American Idol. The only difference is that our students aren't gonna sing as far as I know. Hopefully if they do, they sing better than I do. So as Dr. Bancrazio told us, we had 17 students who entered into this competition and we have whittled that down to the top five. Um, and those are the ones who are gonna present the research today. And you as an audience get to decide who wins the competition. And you'll vote at the end. I promise we will give you lots of opportunities to practice so that you know exactly what you're doing when the vote really counts. So be sure also that you check your event chat so that you can receive additional information from the production crew as we move forward in the um, in the test in the show. So before we start, I should tell you that we do have a panel of VIP judges um, and we're going to start introducing them. So first, let's start with Dr. Stephen Small. So Dr. Small is the Dean of Behavioral and Brain Sciences and he has been a pioneer in understanding the anatomy and physiology of the human brain, particularly related to language comprehension and production. So welcome to, D to Dean Small. Next, we have Nicole Tucker. So Ms. Tucker is a 2004 graduate of the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. She continues to give back to UT Dallas with a scholarship that she established and her support of our alumni center. Ms. Tucker is currently a li licensed and practicing real estate consultant in the North Dallas area. We are so excited to have you with us, Nicole. And finally, we have Dr. Juan Gonzalez, who is the Dean of Graduate Studies, and his research deals with the molecular signaling that bacteria use to communicate during infection and invasion process. Thank you for joining us today, Dean Gonzalez. And welcome to all three of our VIP judges, and we are ready to get started with the competition. So please welcome our very first finalist, Deborah Calderon. Deborah is a graduate student in systems neuroscience, and she works with Dr. Kristen McIntyre. Let's get to know Deborah a little bit before she tells us about her research. So Deborah, society thinks that people with PhDs only focus on their work, but you are a perfect example of being able to do more than one thing and do more than just focus on your research. So I'd really like for you to tell us how you have incorporated dance into while you're still pursuing your doctoral program. Yeah, so I thought that it was really important for me to pursue something outside of school. And so I actually um, am part of a performance team that goes all around Texas performing and I love it. I think that's amazing. So kudos to you for trying to find a balance between work and personal life. I think that's incredible for you. And then let's talk a little bit about your research. So what do you like most about attending UT Dallas? Um, I love that it's so translational. So I, in my little desk cubicle, I have someone from engineering, someone that works with humans, someone that works in wet lab research. And so it's really collaborative and that's definitely been my favorite part of researching here. I think you're right, and that's really true in behavioral and brain sciences. It's a very interdisciplinary area, and I like, I agree, I really like that part that we can um, collaborate with other people in different adjacent areas or even farther away. So now I'd like for you to tell us a little bit about your research, and I'll let you take it away. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Post-traumatic stress disorder affects at least 6% of the global population. And when we think about trauma, we think about inability to extinguish fear associated with a certain cue. So for example, if you're in a car crash, you may develop a fear with driving because there's a fear associated with that cue. And so because of this, we have different levels, we have different exposure-based therapies where in a safe setting, your therapist or psychiatrist might present you with a cue and try to extinguish the fear associated with it but it has a pretty high level of dropout rate and it's not effective long-term. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna hypothesize to you that during the original traumatic event, your emotional level of arousal is really, really high. And so when you're with your therapist or in a safe setting, the emotional level is never quite as high. So your new memory isn't really competitive with your old memory. So our lab was interested in looking at a therapy that would promote learning, promote plasticity, and enhance fear extinction. And vagus nerve stimulation turns out 
to be a really good candidate. The vagus nerve activates a series of neuromodulatory effects, including the locus ceruleus, as evidenced by an increase of norepinephrine in the brain. So my hypothesis with a need of increase in emotional arousal is that the locus ceruleus mediates these therapeutic effects we see from vagus nerve stimulation. So I really have two questions. The first one is if stimulation of the locus ceruleus is sufficient to enhance extinction comparable to VNS. And secondly, whether it is necessary, whether the locus ceruleus is necessary for those therapeutic effects. So our rats go into this behavioral paradigm called auditory fear conditioning, where we present two sounds paired with a foot shock. And over time, they begin to fear the sound because it's associated with that foot shock. So we can then do a post-test and play the sounds in the absence of the foot shock and see how much fear has been acquired. Then we can do a day of treatment, which would be vagus nerve stimulation or targeting the locus aurelius. And then we can do a post-test to see how much fear was actually extinguished with those cues. So this research was actually done by a previous student in our lab, Lindsay Noble, and she demonstrated that if you present the tone by itself as a treatment, it took 20 repetitions of that tone in order to get them to about at a 50% extinction rate. With vagus nerve stimulation, it only took four repetitions of that tone. Now, let me tell you something else. We also only gave treatment to one of those tones. Remember, we presented two, but they got treatment with one. In our extended extinction model, where they only got the sound as a treatment, that's what we saw. They weren't afraid of one sound, but they were still afraid of the other one they didn't get treatment with. With vagus nerve stimulation, we saw a generalization of that treatment to both sounds. How does it do that? It's a good question. So with the help of the Thorn Lab and the Pulaski Lab, we've been able to breed rats that express opsins or channels in the locus ceruleus, which allow us to specifically target it how and when we want to by light. In those rats that don't express this opsin then, we wouldn't expect the locus ceruleus to be activated. So if you look at panel A, there you see an image that I stained of norepinephrine in the locus ceruleus. If you look at picture B, we see those opsins I was talking about um, that are present in the rats. And then if we look at picture C, you see an overlap of those two, where where you see yellow is where I was able to accurately target those um, norepinephrine producing neuron neurons with that opsin. And our preliminary data looks pretty promising. So again, we have the two rats. We have opsin minus, those rats which aren't able to express that opsin. Therefore, when we shine the light, it's not activated. Norepinephrine isn't released on command, as it were. And we have opsin plus in the white circles, which are those rats that do express that opsin. And we can shine a light and activate it on command, <laughs> as it were. And so we see that those rats, when we pair um, this stimulation of the opsins with the tone in treatment seem to extinguish their fear at a faster rate than those rats which do not express that opsin. Now, if you remember that I said my hypothesis is when you have the original traumatic event, you have such a high level of emotional arousal that the new memory created in a safe environment isn't really comparable or isn't strong enough to combat the new one? Well, my hope here is that by releasing norepinephrine on command, paired with the tone, we're able to elevate that level of emotional arousal and make the new memory competitive with the old memory. I hope that through this presentation, you've been able to see that this research is critical to understanding how the therapeutic effects of vagus nerve stimulation are really being mediated so we can target more clear and concise um, treatments for PTSD. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. Great job and way to be our first guinea pig in this type of <laughs> online poster competition. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to turn it over to our VIP judges and we're going to start with Dean Small. So Dean Small, how do you think that Deborah did? Hi, Deborah, you did fabulous. I mean, we're so, so thrilled um, that um, you, you advertise the translational nature of BBS. Um, for everybody in the audience uh, who may not know what translation is. Um, we take basic scientific ideas and we try to bring them into the conceptions for therapy. And so you're dealing with translational research and PTSD, which is amazing. I'm sure everybody knows that PTSD is a huge problem now in our society. Um, 
the, the people coming back from Iraq and other military ventures uh, um, are experiencing PTSD at a very high level. And so this is absolutely great. I do have a question for you though. So you're stimulating the locus ceruleus and the locus ceruleus is known as a source of norepinephrine in the brain. But most of the therapies we use for PTSD therapeutically actually target serotonin. And that uh, seems to be a different nucleus in the brain stem. So how, I know you're very interested in the mechanism, which is critical, because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of someone who wants to know the mechanism before I go prescribe something. So tell us about the relation between uh, you know, the, what you're doing and the, the current therapeutics. Excellent, wonderful question, thank you. Um, so we do know that most, we have a lot of, you know, like you said, serotonin uptake inhibitors and as main antidepressants. And so we don't know exactly how it's mediated, but research has shown so far that the immediate effects of vagus nerve stimulation come from the locus ceruleus being activated first and that release of norepinephrine. But then with chronic stimulation over time, it actually then, you're right, goes on to the dorsi raphe nucleus, which is the source of serotonin. So I would expect that with, you know, starting vagus nerve stimulation, we're talking more about norepinephrine, but then with chronic vagus nerve stimulation over time, we would have a chronic increase in serotonin over time. Super, thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Deborah, and thanks, Dean Small, for that excellent question. Nicole, do you have any comments for Deborah? Hi, Deborah. Yes, I do. First of all, I have to say I really enjoyed your excitement level. I can feel that um, this research project was um, very engaging. And also, I found it seems like you discovered even future, um, you know, kind of additional research needed to continue on with this, which I love. Um, to piggyback on what um, Dean Small said about PTSD and troops. I also, um, being a volunteer for CASA, we have a lot of children and families that experience PTSD. So I can see this being extremely beneficial to our entire population. And I just, I um, am really intrigued by this. And I find it fascinating that you found that it was five times faster. I mean, that's, I think that's just incredible. Thank you, Nicole. Dean Gonzalez, would you like to add anything? Yes, Deborah, that was a fantastic talk. It kept me engaged all the time. It's a very timely topic, and I really congratulate you on that great work that you're doing. So keep it up. Thank you so much. All right, excellent job, Deborah. We are so proud of you. So thank you so much for sharing your work and telling us about your dancing on the side as well. So that's kind of fun. Um, but now what I want to do is invite the audience to participate in our very first activity where you get to interact. And so you had some information before about how to participate in today's session. There's a slide on the screen. Um, so grab your phone, your cell phone and let's get started. So first, what you need to do is open up your texting app on your smartphone and start a new text. You're going to type it in to 37607. And then in the place where you put the information about the text, type UTD Research 004 and hit send. Once you do that, you will receive an auto response um, from Poll Anywhere and that's saying that you're in and everything's ready to go. And then we can participate, all of us can participate in today's activities. So we'll give everyone a minute to get started. Again, 37607, and you'll type UTD Research 004. All right, and it looks like our poll is up. We're going to start with a really easy one. It's coming. So what we want to know is, where are you watching us from? So please text us the city from which you're watching this competition. So I see lots of areas from North Dallas um, on there. We have some different states. I see Iowa on there. Um, and we're even going international. We have some people from Istanbul and Bangalore, so that's really exciting. So let's see where else. And just so you know how a word cloud works, the more people who say that they're from Dallas, for instance, makes the word bigger. So we have a lot of people from Dallas and Richardson, but we have a lot of other places as well. Hi um, to people from San Antonio and Michigan. 
And where else do we have people from? We have um, Plano, Rockwall, India's on there too. Wow, this is amazing. Chicago, awesome. Hopefully you've watched The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. It's really fun to watch if you're a Bulls fan. <laughs> we have Bloomington on there. Allen, Cedar Rapids. I think you're doing great. Looks like everyone's gotten the hang of this, which is really exciting. So you're doing great. So maybe just a tiny bit longer. We'll keep the, the poll open. I see Gainesville on there too. All right. Spokane, Washington, thanks for joining us. All right, where else do we have on there? Good job, so that's exactly how you're gonna vote during the entire um, show and just keep practicing. We have some different types of questions that we're going to ask, some that'll test your brain power and some that are a little bit easier, like the one you just had. And then remember at the very end, that's exactly how you're going to vote when it's time to pick our winner. So right now, we're going to uh, move on to our second presenter, and that's Adrian DeFroy. And Adrian is a doctoral student in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing, and she works with Dr. Pam Rollins in the Social Communications Lab. So Adrian, before we begin and you tell us about your research, you've had the opportunity to travel and to live overseas. And considering that we can't travel right now, I think we just can live vicariously through your previous experiences. So can you tell us a little bit about when you lived overseas before you started your doctoral program? And I want to know about the waffles from where you were. So Adrian. <laughs> Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, I left my job of 10 years. I worked in the schools for 10 years, and two days later, uh, my husband and I were on an airplane to Belgium, and we spent the summer in Belgium and then, uh, you know, flew home and started my PhD. So it was certainly an interesting way to uh, spend the summer, live somewhere else, and you're right, the waffles are amazing, and I miss them so much. I'm, I'm just curious, did you take a waffle maker? class when you were there? <laughs> well, the secret really seems to be in the, uh, the the raw materials that they use. So we really just can't replicate it over here. So we really have to go back if we, uh, if we want any real decent Belgian waffles. That's such a shame to have to go back to Belgium, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about your research. So why did you choose PH, um, choose UTD to pursue your PhD? Yeah, so I actually did my undergrad here at UTD. We won't say how many years ago. Um, so being back there now is it's just like going home. It's like like returning to home and, and being back to where um, I came from. Although right now it's a little too much like being at home with everything going on. So, but I just absolutely love it. Awesome. We are so excited to hear about your research. So I'm going to let you go ahead and take us away or take it away and share your information about your research poster with us. Yes, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining me as I share data we collected regarding the efficacy of an early inter intervention program for children with autism called Pathways. Autism is characterized by deficits in social communication or communication that attempts to engage another person. Research has historically measured sociability of communication in one of two ways. The first is by looking at the communicative intention or the why of the communication. Young children's communication is divided into three categories with behavior regulation being the least social, then social routines, and then mutual attention. The second way to measure sociability is the number of behaviors produced. For example, uh, the little boy on the left is using one behavior in isolation. He's pointing. And in the picture on the right, he's coordinating multiple behaviors. He's vocalizing, pointing, and making eye contact with mom. Continuously aims to find the most effective interventions for children with autism. Many interventions use a linguistic model, which focuses on acquiring words. But for children with autism who have deficits in joint attention, 
Evidence suggests a linguistic model increases vocabulary, but not social communication. So you might have a child who can label objects, but isn't communicating socially with others. For these children, the evidence indicates we should focus on building foundational social skills before working on words. This brings us to Pathways Early Autism Intervention. Pathways focuses on early social skills, not words. So it's different from many early intervention services in place now in the state of Texas. The purpose of this study was to evaluate the efficacy of pathways in remediating the core social communication deficits in toddlers with autism. Specifically, we wanted to know if toddlers in the pathways group made greater gains than toddlers in the service. Those two higher levels of communication, social routine and mutual attention in coordination of communicative behaviors and in coordination at each level of communicative intention. So are they coordinating more within behavior regulation, social routine, and mutual attention? To do this, we analyzed data from 55 toddlers and a parent, each randomly assigned either to pathways or services as usual. The participants were representative of the population of children receiving early intervention services here in Texas. They were ethnically and economically diverse and were largely cognitively and linguistically impaired. During the 12 week intervention, parents in the pathways group received weekly coaching sessions of one and a half hours each, where they were taught how to interact with their child. And then they practiced these skills throughout the week during regular interactions with their child. The participants in the services as usual group continued to receive their regular intervention services for an average of about six and a half hours per week. Before and after intervention, we collected videos of parents playing with their child. Each time the child communicated with the parent, we coded that communication for its level of communicative intention and whether the child used only one behavior or coordinated multiple behaviors together. We found toddlers in both groups made similar change in all levels of communicative intention. And you'll see most of the change for the groups occurred in that lower level intention of behavior regulation. Contrary to our hypothesis that the pathways group would outperform their peers in social routine and mutual attention, very little change was made by participants in either group in these categories. We suspect this is due to the significant level of impairment of the toddlers in our sample and that many of them were not yet ready for intentional communication. For our second question, as hypothesized, we found that toddlers in the pathways group made greater gains in coordination of two or more behaviors than those who received services as usual. Finally, we found most of the difference in coordination between the two groups was occurring within behavior regulations which makes sense when we think back to our results from our first research question and how little action we saw in the two higher levels of communicative intention. Our results support the efficacy of pathways in remediating the core social communication deficits in toddlers with autism, as the children in the pathways group made more growth in the coordination of two or more communicative behaviors. This is really notable given that the pathways intervention only took one and a half hours per week, while the children in services as usual spent on average six and a half hours per week receiving intervention. These findings have real world implications for state funded early intervention for children with autism in Texas. Thank you. Great job, Adrienne. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I am very appreciative of the fact that you focus on those early emerging skills um, before they get words, because some of those kids might not get words. And so I think that's a really important um, feature that you're focusing on. So congratulations on a great poster. We're going to turn this over to our VIP judges, starting with Nicole. Nicole, do you have any questions or comments for Adrian? Um, I don't think I have any questions. Um, I did like that you made sure to have a really diverse group. Um, I think that's important. And, and just really blown away in the difference between a child getting six and a half hours of treatment intervention help as compared to one and a half hours. I mean, that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd really like to see this continue on and grow. And like you said, hopefully get state funding. That would be fantastic. We would love that too. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Nicole, for that comment. Um, let's go to Dean Gonzalez. 
Adrienne, this is a, another example of why I'm so proud of our graduate students. Great talk, a, a really great area, very uh, interest, a uh, lot of interest in this particular area, and your research is very solid. It, it's I can see a lot of application in the future. Fantastic, very good Thank job. You. Thank you so much. Couldn't agree more. And Dean Small, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Oh yeah, you don't get to be a dean without having a big mouth. So sure, Adriana, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it was really, really fabulous. Um, it's so nice. Um, um, as everyone can see, we have a combination of research that is both in animal models, but also in the real world with real children and real families trying to help them. It's really so exciting to see. And autism spectrum disorder is uh, is uh, either much more we're much more aware of it than before. It's much more prevalent than before. So the the importance is just really really high. So I come from a background in functional communication. I did I work in aphasia. I'm a speech language hearing scientist myself. And so one of the one of the um, ideas that people have is in order to evaluate therapeutic interventions, you have to do it sort of in the real world and see how the children, what are the outcome measures? So um, are you, do you have any uh, a plan to, to look at outcome measures in the school, at, you know, actually how these kids are doing in the school, on the playground, in the real world, so you can evaluate, um, take from the laboratory, um, the human laboratory, <laughs> but the laboratory nonetheless, <laughs> Uh, to the real world? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. So, you know, of course, if we can't replicate these findings in a real world scenario, they don't really help much, do they? So, yes, we absolutely have plans. We are in um, the very beginning stages of getting participants for a, um, a new study where we actually are having um, ECI, early interventionists, um, implementing this in real world conditions and their regular schedule um, and seeing if we can replicate the same great findings we found in our um, laboratory setting in the real world. Adrian, thank you so much for that wonderful and um, important presentation. We're so excited for you and to see your work in the future. Right now, what we're going to do is move on to our second poll. So we want everyone in the audience to participate in another activity to help us get ready for voting at the end of the show. So if you participated in the last activity, you're just going to need to send another text. But if not, here's the instructions again. Type text UTD Research 004 to 37607. And then once you receive the auto response, you're in and you'll be ready to go. So once you receive that response from Pull Anywhere, you're ready to go. And here is our question. How much does an adult brain weigh? Four pounds, three pounds, two pounds, or six pounds? So while you're pondering that, I'm going to give you a couple of fun facts that the animal with the heaviest brain is the sperm whale. And the sperm whale's brain weighs about 20 pounds. And the animal with the lightest brain is the Etruscan shrew. Um, and that brain weighs about 65 grams. So we are somewhere in between a shrew and a sperm whale. So let's see, I think we might, I don't know if we're quite close to the size of the brain of the sperm whale. <laughs> it looks like six pounds is, is the overarching um, response of the audience. Ooh, three pounds is gaining some leverage here. So let's see what's going to happen. So you can see that it's changing in real time. This is very similar to what we'll see in the final vote. So, ooh, it's a it's a toss up. Is it three pounds or six pounds? What do you think? You guys are doing a great job. I love how well you are putting in your oh, answers. Goodness. And hmm, the answer is three pounds. So everyone who picked three pounds, good for you. You are correct. The average uh, human brain weighs about three pounds. So good job, about a third of us picked that. So well done. So what we're gonna do now, I think we are ready to use our brains and welcome our next contestant. We have Robert Morrison. Robert is a graduate student who works with Dr. Mike Kilgard studying neuroscience. And Robert, I think you are our only hope for a good singer of this, of all of the contestants based on your passion for musical theater. So I'm helping, hoping that you can tell us a little bit about musical theater and how that played a role in your life. Uh, hi, yeah, so um, it's kind of funny. I almost went into musical theater going into college. Um, I'm 
I still like musical theater to this day, but I'm really glad that I didn't, or else I probably wouldn't have gone into neuroscience. But um, I do think that the skills that I picked up in theater are definitely helping me, you know, present my work to people. Um, and I find that I really enjoy talking to people about it. So I think I did pull something from that experience. It always gives you something different to talk about, right? Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> so now a little bit about um, some other things about you. So I know way better than to ask a graduate student when they're graduating, um, but I'd like to know a little bit about what you plan to do after you graduate for, with your PhD. <laughs> that is a really good question. And there are, uh, I definitely have a lot of things to think about as far as that, so I don't have a super clear answer, but um, right now I'm thinking of either going into academia um, and trying to split focus between teaching and doing research because I find that I really like to teach students, particularly in like introductory classes about neuroscience and kind of the basics. Um, or I might, uh, I'm also looking at maybe uh, positions in public policy and um, trying to kind of inform the public and, and the government on, you know, how, how to interpret research findings. So those are two of my biggest interests right now. I think both of those sound like really promising ways for you to go once you graduate. So good luck in your endeavors there. But right now I'm going to wish you good luck as you present your poster. So tell us a little bit about your research. Cool, thank you. So um, just to get started, um, I'm here to tell you about vagus nerve stimulation uh, and using it to treat motor dysfunction after stroke. Um, so what is the vagus nerve? The vagus nerve is a cranial nerve running from the brain to the gut and it communicates information about heart rate, breathing, and digestion. Stimulation of the vagus nerve has been FDA approved for over two decades now. And to stimulate the nerve, a nerve cuff is implanted around the vagus and is connected to a battery pack implanted in the chest. Um, recently, vagus nerve stimulation, or VNS for short, has been used to enhance the effects of rehabilitation after stroke. And so far, VNS paired rehabilitation has proven successful in two separate clinical trials. I'm um, looking at trial number one over here, if we look at these patients' improvements on the upper extremity fugal mire exam, which measures upper body strength and mobility, we can see that patients that receive rehab alone made small gains in recovery, but patients that get VNS um, see significantly more in uh, recovery comparatively. Uh, during clinical trial number two, this result was replicated. And even more at the end of the study, patients in the rehab only group were crossed over to get VNS and saw an almost identical increase in recovery. So these clinical results are really promising, but I personally don't work with people in the clinic. I study VNS preclinically in rats, and you can see a really similar effect of VNS on recovery from stroke in rats as well. Um, in the next panel, uh, in this study, rats were trained to do a difficult for them task. And after training, these rats are really good at this task. Um, they successfully do it about 90% of the time. But after being given a stroke, they're really horrible at the task and their performance plummets. They have very little strength of dexterity and they can't perform it very well. If we put these rats through six weeks of physical therapy, we see that rats that get VNS have a much greater recovery compared to those that get rehab alone. So it looks like VNS can enhance rehab in both rats and humans, but how exactly is VNS working? Um, so we can get a clue if we look at these rats' brains after VNS. Using a procedure called intracortical microstimulation, or ICMS, we can look into the rat's motor cortex and make a map of how it's organized. The motor cortex is organized into movement representations, which are clusters of neurons that help move certain body parts. Uh, so looking at this naive rat motor cortex over here, uh, you can see that each of the colors correspond to a body part, where red areas control the jaw, yellow areas control the distal forelimb, green controls the proximal forelimb, and blue controls the hind limb. And these clusters of neurons can change their connections over time through a process called synaptic plasticity, and they can shrink and grow during skill learning. Studies have shown that pairing VNS with motor training can enlarge representations specific to the training. For example, down here, um, when we teach rats a distal forelimb wheel spinning task, they end up having an expansion of distal forelimb areas in the brain. This yellow area has grown. Similarly, when you teach rats a proximal forelimb lever pressing task, you can see an expansion of proximal forelimb areas in the, in the brain. This green area has now expanded here. So what we think is going on is that VNS paired with rehabilitation is reorganizing the brain and allowing it to make new connections that can bypass any old injured ones after stroke, resulting in enhanced recovery. But one thing that I wondered was if VNS was limited to changing only forelimb areas in the brain, or if we could change other areas. 
To test this, we wanted to pair VNS with jaw movement during eating to see if jaw areas in the motor cortex could subsequently expand. So we designed a behavioral task where we dispense a food pellet, wait for the rat to eat it, and then we pair VNS during chewing. To make sure that we were stimulating uh, using VNS at the right time, we used EMG to measure muscle activity in the jaw. And here in panel C, you can see uh, that when the sensor starts reading this rhythmic activity during chewing, uh, we give VNS here in red at the precise uh, time that the rat is chewing. So in this experiment, rats were either given sham stimulation, no VNS, uh, or VNS paired with chewing for five days. Then ICMS was used to go into the motor cortex and look at representations. And looking at the results down here, rats that got VNS paired with chewing had significantly more jaw representation in the motor cortex. So it does look like VNS is able to increase plasticity in more than just four limb areas. This is a really exciting result because often stroke patients don't just have upper limb impairment, but they also suffer from a number of other uh, disorders like disrupted speech and swallowing. So if we could potentially pair VNS with therapy for one of those, say speech therapy, for example, we could maybe see a similar enhancement of recovery that we saw in the clinical trials looking at upper body strength. So to wrap up, VNS paired with rehab enhances recovery compared to rehabilitation alone after stroke. VNS is also able to increase plasticity in motor cortex specific to the movement that it's paired with. And this increase in plasticity isn't just limited to four limb areas, but can happen in jaw areas as well. Uh, thanks so much for having me today, and I, I really hope that you took something away from this presentation and learned a little bit about VNS today. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. I personally am not a huge fan of rats, but I'm a fan of your work. I think your clinical implications are really exciting, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. We're going to turn this over to our VIP judges, and let's start with Dean Gonzalez. Robert, another great example of the groundbreaking research that uh, we are performing here at UT Dallas. This is a very solid research, beautifully presented, and, and congratulations. You're doing a fantastic job. Keep it thank up. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dean Gonzalez. Let's turn it over to Dean Small. Do you have any comments for, for Robert? No. No, that's not true. I do have comments, of course. <laughs> Robert, as you know, very interested in stroke recovery. I've published in that area. I think it's really exciting. Stroke is such a prevalent problem in our society. Um, so many people have it. And when a neurologist goes in and sees a patient, sees a family, usually what we say is, you know, we're sorry you had a stroke. Please modify your diet. Please exercise. We'll prevent the next one. But there's not much we can do to get the, you know, the arm muscles back, the jaw muscles back, the things you're talking about. So it's really, really, really important. I really appreciate that. I'm going to ask you a similar question that I asked earlier today. So assuming that VNS does increase norepinephrine in the brain, we know from stroke trials in the past that in fact um, giving, um, um, so norepinephrine as you know is a major catecholamine and there are uh, various drugs that are catecholaminergic that cause increased catecholamines in the brain. Human trials with those catecholamines have generally failed. So Tell me, um, how, how can you reconcile your course of research, and it may relate to whether norepinephrine is the key or not, your research with what I know to be, uh, you know, the clinical case in human beings in, in trials? That, that's a really good question, and I think it's a, I'm really glad that you brought this up because I think it's central to understanding how, how VNS is actually, how we think VNS is working in both these, these people who are going through these clinical trials and the rats that are getting it in the lab. Um, so when you give someone a pill, um, that maybe increases norepinephrine or, or neurotransmitter levels. Uh, it's it's global. Um, you know they're they're increased for a long period of time all over the brain. But what we think we're doing with VNS is we are activating the nerve that signal sent up to the brain, and those neuromodulatory centers are turned on for just a split second. So when someone's actually using their limbs to do physical rehabilitation, if you pair VNS right when they're using those muscles, the neurons that are controlling the muscles coming from the motor cortex get that little uh, spike in neurotransmitters, and then they can only those circuits can rewire. Um, if you give VNS, um, there have been some studies that have shown that there's a window from muscle activity to um, be able to give VNS, and it's about two seconds. So if someone moves their muscles during physical rehabilitation, and you wait 30 seconds and then give VNS, those connections aren't potentiated. So 
Um, it's not so much that the drugs don't work because they're increasing the wrong thing, but I think it's just the timing is often that we need precise activation of those neuromodulatory centers and not global activation of them. Excellent answer, Robert. Um, and now, Nicole, do you have any comments or questions for Robert? I do. Um, I To piggyback on the others, I think this research is really fantastic. Um, it's incredible to see that something, I mean, while it's very complex and a little bit like over my head, um, I think I got it because <laughs> you were able to explain it very, very well. And I just find it amazing that something um, you know, that seems so simple could speed up you know, therapy and repair and really help people with the quality of their life and being able to um, recover quickly, decrease medical care costs, you know, all, so many different things. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. I completely agree. You did a great job taking a very complex topic and making it accessible um, for all of us. So thank you so much for that. Well done. Uh, we're going to take this time and move on to our next activity. So for those of you who just joined us, the graphic on the screen tells you exactly how to use Poll Anywhere. Again, text UTD Research 004 to 37607. You will receive an auto response and then you are good to go. And again, if you participated in the previous activity, then you all you have to do is text your answer to this next question. So, OK, true or false, the UTD um, chess team has won or tied for the first 10 times at the Pan American Intercollegiate Championship. So I will let you know that when I first came here, when we talk about the final four, I always think of March Madness, but at UTD, the final four is the final four in chess. So we do have an excellent team. And you can see here, it looks like a lot of our audience knows that the um, predominant answer here looks like it's true, but we have a couple holding on to false. While we're doing this, I'm gonna give you a couple fun facts. UT Dallas actually offers two online courses. Um, using chess in the classroom for undergraduate credit. And those classes are taught by Dr. Alexi Root, who is a former US women's chess champion. So awesome. I think it looks pretty clear that the answer is true. So the UT Dallas chess team has won or tied for the first 10 times at the Pan American Intercollegiate Championships. So well done. Go UTD, go Comets. We're gonna go ahead. We have so three of our contestants have already presented. We have two left to go, and we're gonna move on to our next contestant who is Olga Peskova. And Olga is a PhD student studying speech, language, and hearing with Dr. Peter Osman in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences. And they work in the Speech Perception Lab. So first, I just wanna give props to Olga. She's our only international student who's in the competition today. So congratulations for that. Olga, you mentioned that you have a teaching certificate in psychotherapeutic yoga. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you got into that? Uh, yes, sure. I'm very excited to be here and thank you for introducing me. And yes, I actually, when I moved to the US and started my PhD program, as for me and maybe some other students, it's very stressful. It has a lot of demands to your brain and basically get everything out of you. So I was looking for some ways to feel more relaxed and more balanced. So I found this amazing program that's called like psychotherapeutic yoga that connects your mind and your body and providing you some techniques that you can do in your body to actually like deal with anxiety and stress and sometimes depression because we all sometimes have these different episodes. So it's actually was uh, working really great for me. So and I was doing it for more than three years now. So it's what I do. <laughs> I am so proud of you for taking care of your well-being and um, you know making sure that you're taking care of yourself as you go through these really strenuous programs. And like you said, it, it really we we test your your brain and and your reserve. And I think you're doing a great job. I'd like to know a little bit more about what brought you to UTD from Russia. Tell me more about that. Thanks. And actually, first time I came here, I came as a Fulbright scholar. 
and I was very excited to work with my mentor at this time, Dr. Emily Toby. So I actually knew her work even when I was in Russia. So I was really excited to come here. And after that, it was an opportunity to continue my study and join UTD as a PhD student. And I, of course, just took it and uh, never regretted it. <laughs> Absolutely, you're doing a great job and I believe you got a master's along the way. Yeah, um, I did. <laughs> in speech language pathology. So thank you so much for telling us a little bit about you. Now we'd like to hear about your poster um, about looking at speech perception and production in children who have cochlear implants. So take thank it away. You. It's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, hello. I don't. OK, here you go. I'm sorry for the delay. So I will uh, tell you about evaluation of speech perception and production error patterns in normal hearing children and children using cochlear implants. And why I got very interested in this topic, because I was always interested in how to improve communication in children with hearing loss and especially for children who are using cochlear implants. And uh, why am I interested in cochlear implants? Uh, because cochlear implant is a very unique device that surgically implanted in the middle ear in the cochlea, and it's allowed to receive a sense of hearing for children with severe to profound hearing losses. And it's been uh, very successful, but we also the performance of the children who are using cochlear implants associated with wide variability of scores. So some kids are doing really well, some kids doing not so well. So I was always puzzled by that. And to actually communicate effectively, we need to hear the speech, so perceive the sound and say it back, so produce the sound. And it's been shown that uh, it could be different with normal hearing children and children with cochlear implants. So I was really interested to compare these performances between these two groups. So for this research, uh, we included 20 children using cochlear implants from nine to five years of age and 20 children with normal hearing from four to seven years of age, and they've been matched by hearing age. So it means that children who receive cochlear implants, they usually receive it uh, from six to 36 months of age. So it's where the hearing age is starting. So we try to match our normal hearing group based on this time that they actually receive access to hearing. So to evaluate our uh, question of perception and production performance, we uh, used modified version of California consonant test that include 12 consonants, six fricatives and six stop consonants, and they've been presented in a different CVC words, uh, consonant vowel consonant words. So for perception experiment, children saw four different pictures on the screen, different only initial or in the final position. So for example, this uh, uh, example here on the screen, they needed to discriminate between words sail, tail, pale, fail. And the instruction was show me sail. And for production, we used the same stimulus. So they needed to say the same word. So the instruction was say the word sail. And we recorded their performance and analyzed it. So here is our results. And on the graphs, you can see that blue graph indicate the performance of children with normal hearing and red indicate the performance of children with cochlear implants. And one thing that uh, you need to pay attention on that higher bars actually here represent the worst performance because we are plotting the error patterns. So uh, basically first what we looked at, it's the difference between perception and production performance between normal hearing and children with cochlear implants. And they actually surprisingly didn't find any differences because we was expected that children with cochlear implants will perceive and produce sounds much worse. So it's a good news for children with cochlear implants. It seems like they're actually doing pretty well, but their production was uh, a little bit uh, better than their perception. And it's also was a little surprising because in normal hearing children, you think that you need to hear the word first to be able to produce it later. And here we think that it's probably effective therapy that children with cochlear implant receiving throughout their lives. But uh, the interesting result was when we looked at individual features for uh, manner and voicing consonants. So we separated stop versus fricative consonant, and we found that children with cochlear implants perceive stop consonant a little bit worse than children with normal hearing. 
And for voiced features, we found that they actually perceive a uh, voiced consonant also worse than children with normal hearing. So we actually found some difference when we looked at uh, our data more specifically. And next question we had, we actually wanted to create kind of map between perception and production performances for children with cochlear implants, looking at the individual consonants, so how they're doing. And here you can see the difference between two group and on the top it's perception performance and on the bottom it's production performance. But when we looked at perception of children with cochlear implants in normal hearing, we found that the error patterns are actually really similar. They both have most difficulties perceiving V sound, but the substitution, the errors that we're making, it's actually different. So normal hearing kids substituted by F sound, which is very typical, and cochlear implanted kids substituted for Z sound, which is a little atypical. So uh, we actually, even though we found the same pattern, the mechanism driving this pattern could be different. But when we looked at production performance, we actually also saw some similarities uh, between two groups. So the hardest, uh, sounds for them to produce was TH and V sound. But also very important thing here, as you can see for perception and production pattern overall, they're not actually exactly mirroring each other. So some sounds you can actually perceive, but not necessarily produce and vice versa. So we found that it's very interesting uh, data in our work because potentially you can create this profile for each children with cochlear implants when they come to the clinic and find out uh, what the errors are uh, associated with. So they cannot really perceive it, so it's maybe difficulties in perceiving this signal that goes through the cochlear implants, or maybe they have some articulatory issues and we cannot really produce it. So our main conclusion here that production and perception not really mirroring each other, so and therapy for children with cochlear implants need to be considered both perception and production to uh, perform the best outcomes for these children. And we thank uh, my committee who helped me with uh, this work and uh, pointing from UT Dallas. And thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I'm all ears. <laughs> Thank you so much, Olga. As someone who also studies children with cochlear implants, I appreciate that you're tackling that big question about perception. So what people hear or what these children hear and how they produce those sounds. So thank you so much for that. We're gonna turn it over to our VIP judges. I okay. would ask Dean Small if he has a comment or question, but we all know that the answer is going to be yes. So Dean Small, let's hear what you have to say for Olga. Andrew, are you calling me a big mouth? Never. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm honored. I'm honored. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Dr. Warder Sist is one of, uh, what, as, as you know, Olga, one of the experts at cochlear implant research, and uh, it's wonderful having uh, Andrew at our school. But uh, the um, um, and just for the audience's benefit, cochlear implants are so important because children with severe hearing loss now have opportunity for language development that it was very hard, well, um, English language development. So there's a, um, some children, as you know, nationwide have uh, development of uh, um, American Sign Language in the US, other sign languages in other countries, um, but we give the opportunity of these children to actually learn and process English and develop their English language skills. So huge importance uh, and, and having them be able to understand what's going on in their environments is really critical. Um, of course, I have a question. I always have a question. Um, and um, it's along the lines of the question that I asked uh, your colleague at the Callier Center, um, which uh, has to do with uh, sort of naturalistic environment and real world outcomes. Now, um, these children are not living in a world where they can't see the lips and mouth of the speaker. So they're living in a world where what they're processing is a combination of what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And you mentioned stop consonants and stop consonants obviously are particularly visualizable, right? right? And so the question is, you know, do you think your research data would hold over um, in, in an experiment where you actually did this in an audiovisual modality rather than an audio only modality? 
Thank you so much. This is a wonderful question because it's actually one of the things that uh, we was planning to do as a follow up study uh, because uh, we created our own stimulus. So one of uh, our actually uh, PhD students uh, gave their voice to be part of this experiment. So our next uh, step was to actually record him as a uh, visual stimulus as well. So and it would be fantastic. And another my future direction is actually I want to record the kids producing the same words. So uh, it would be interesting to see how our kids produce the voice, not only adults that usually we use in experiment, but also the peers. So this is kind of my next step. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Excellent. I'm glad you have a plan for your next steps. Um, right now, your next step is to listen to what Nicole has to say about your presentation. So, Nicole. Hi, yes, I thought um, the biggest part for me was how you walked us through your results on your poster because it could be confusing. As you mentioned, you know, the negative result would actually be higher and so forth. So it was really beneficial to have you walk us through all of that. And I'm just really impressed of the amount of data that you had to collect and to test over all the different um, sounds and syllables. So I think it was just really wonderful and probably quite an undertaking for you to go through all of this and I'm excited to see your, your next steps. Thank you so much and I'm really uh, glad that um, I had a lot of support from UT Dallas faculties and uh, students, undergraduate and graduate students who helped me with data collection and overall research. Thank you. Wonderful. Now let's turn it over to um, Dean Gonzalez. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes, Olga, you're a great example of our very large international population, very diverse population we have in UT Dallas. Um, this is the kind of work that really has impact on people's life. Uh, so I, you, I really, really appreciate you for that great job and, and beautiful presentation, by the way. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words. <laughs> All right, thank you. So by now you're all pretty familiar with Poll Anywhere, but in case you've just joined us, text UTV Research 004 to 37607, like it shows on the screen. And once you receive the auto response, you will be all ready to participate in our next activity. So here we have it. We told you ahead of time that we were going to quiz you on this slide. So let's see who actually really paid attention. So here um, we showed this slide and what it looks like and we want you to answer the following question what is the total projected um, fiscal year 2020 research expenditures for ut dallas so your choices are 85 million 100 million 115 or 130 million Ooh, our answers are all over the board, except no one's picking 100 million. I guess it's just a regular standard number, so you think it's going to be something a little bit different. So it looks like we're somewhere between 115 and 130, according to the audience. Oh, thank you. Thank you for making me feel better. I was feeling sorry for the 100 million, but then you just took it away. So 115, 130, what's it going to be? I can't wait to find out. I'm sure you can't either. And it's still going and our answer is 130 million. So that's what was expected, but our recent numbers are showing that it actually might be a little bit higher and closer to 133 million. And I also just want to point out um, that in 2016, UTD earned our classification as a Carnegie R1 doctoral institution of the highest research activity. And that's a designation that's based largely on the aggregate quantity of the research that we have at our institution. So the correct answer here was 130 million. So good job, well done. Um, you did a great job on the polling. So remember, it's coming up really soon, the one that really counts when we pick our winner. But right now we can't pick our winner without having our fifth contestant. And up next we have Monica Trevino. And so Monica hails from Wisconsin and she is in our AUD PhD program. So what that means is that she is getting two doctorate degrees, a clinical degree in audiology, which is the study of hearing and balance, and then a research degree in her PhD. 
Monica studies with Eddie Loberinus in the Department of Speech, Language and Hearing Science, and she's going to tell us um, a little bit about herself. So Monica, you did share an interesting fact with us about soccer, which is a game that you essentially have played since you were in the womb. So can you share with the audience some of your fondest memories playing soccer? Yeah, absolutely. So like like you mentioned, Dr. Warnes is pretty much as soon as I could walk, I think my dad put a soccer ball in front of me. Um, and so over the years, I've been playing soccer in middle school and high school. But I would say my one of my most favorite memories was when I played on a 3v3 team. So it's a lot smaller uh, team than a typical soccer game. And we went to Florida. Uh, to play in a national tournament where my team played against actually a Texas team. I'm from Wisconsin originally, and we won this national championship. So that was really exciting, especially as a 12 year old. Uh, and really soccer's just developed me as a person over the years, so. <laughs> so awesome. So I'm glad to hear that um, you know you did really well in soccer, but you know, we do know that you're still peaking because you're in two doctoral programs yeah. right now. So yeah. good for you. I'd like for you to tell us a little bit about how you chose this field of audiology and why the two, two doctoral degrees, why is that your path? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so really, I, I decided to get into audiology and hearing science um, because I, I really like helping people. I think probably everyone says that, but um, but really, I, I have some family members who have hearing loss that I grew up with. Uh, big shout out to my uncle Dan. He he grew up with a cochlear implant and a hearing aid, and he really inspired me with his humor and his joy to to tackle challenges head on and, and showed me what kinds of challenges hearing impaired people face all the time. So that sort of steered me in this direction, and here I am today. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about yourself. And now I'd like for you to share a little bit about your research. So I'll let you go ahead and present your poster to the audience. Absolutely. OK, so the title of my poster is The Acoustic Reflex and Auditory Perception Tasks in Carboplatin Treated Chinchillas. And the purpose of my project is to investigate the role of the inner hair cell in functional listening. So just like the rods and cones in your eyes, your ears have two big sensory cells inner hair cells and outer hair cells. The inner hair cell is the one that does the heavy lifting. Um, it's the one that sends sound information up to your brain. So we're especially interested in how it works. First, imagine you have two patients that are walking into a clinic with the exact same hearing loss. One patient really struggles in background noise, like restaurants and crowds, and the other patient does okay. The audiogram, our most common test in audiology, isn't sensitive to the differences these patients are experiencing. We think that the patient who has more difficulty may be experiencing a more specific kind of hearing loss, inner hair cell loss. So the purpose of this project is to find a simple diagnostic test that is sensitive enough to detect inner hair cell loss. And we do this using the chinchilla carboplatin model. I think some of you might be thinking, why the chinchilla? <laughs> As it turns out, chinchillas have been used for decades in auditory research because their ears are similar to humans and they can be trained to respond to different auditory tasks. Chinchillas also have a very unique response to the chemotherapy drug carboplatin. When chinchillas are given carboplatin, they experience selective inner hair cell loss. That is, the inner hair cells in the inner ear are destroyed while the outer hair cells remain unaffected. So this model gives us a really good chance to look at the role of the inner hair cell in our ears and how we hear. For this project, we used a within subjects, subjects design where we perform multiple baseline tests on all of the animals. We treat them with carboplatin and then we repeat all of the same tests to look at the changes. Before I dive into the test results, I'd like to start with the hair cells themselves. We look at the ears to make sure the carboplatin did what we expected it to do. And as you can see, we had about 55 to 85% inner hair cell loss throughout the inner ear, a large amount, while the outer hair cells remained totally intact. So the carboplatin did what we thought. <laughs> Next, we look at DPOEs and the pure tone audiogram. These are both very common clinical tests. We use them every day in audiology to see if there's any changes pre and post our treatment. And consistent with our previous results, there are no clinically significant differences after inner hair cell loss. But we didn't stop there. We kept looking and we looked at the animal's ability to detect gaps in continuous noise. So short gaps in continuous noise are more difficult to detect than long gaps. 
we use two levels of carrier noise, a really high level 80 dB and then a mid level 60 dB. And in the easier condition, the 80 dB, there were no changes between pre and post. However, in that mid level condition, we start to see some problems. If you look on average, we had to nearly double the duration of the gap. We had to make it a lot longer before the animals were able to hear it. Gap detection is thought to be an indirect and universal measure of the brain's ability to process sound over time. Based on these results, it's possible inner hair cells play a role in this very key auditory principle. The last test, I promise it's the last test, <laughs> we looked at was the acoustic reflex. The acoustic reflex is the ear's automatic response to loud sounds. So bam, you hear a loud sound, your ear has a built-in protective response to make that sound a little less loud. Measuring the acoustic reflex is a gold standard audiological test. We use it all the time in clinic. This reflex is thought to be triggered by, you guessed it, the inner hair cells, <laughs> exactly what we're looking at. What we expected to see was a reduction or a total lack of response. Instead, we found that the reflex stayed the same or actually increased falling inner hair cell loss in every tested condition. This was very surprising, uh, especially considering, again, the degree of that inner hair cell loss that we caused. No inner hair cells should mean no reflex. So moving forward, we are very excited to take a closer look at this data, especially for the individual animals and to also gather more data to see if there's any more changes that we may have missed. Right now, this research is still limited to the animal world, but if we're able to develop a simple diagnostic test to detect inner hair cell loss, then we can translate that test to clinic. Once we're able to diagnose these patients, we can approach their appointments a little differently, initially through things like counseling, but potentially in the future so through something a little different, maybe a new intervention like a special speech processing strategy in hearing aids or innovative assistive listening devices or some other brand new treatment that I haven't dreamed up yet. <laughs> uh, once we're able to detect the problem, then we can start to work at treating it. So that is all the time I have. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, I'm assuming that when you say that chinchillas have ears similar to humans, you mean in function and not in aesthetics, right? Correct. correct. Just Although checking. their ears are kind of big. <laughs> yes, they are. They're still really cute, so I'm not taking that away from them. Um, but let's actually turn this over to our VIP judges. We're going to start with Dean Gonzalez. Let's hear wow. from you. Monica, what a way to end. Fantastic talk. Very, very good. You know, for those of uh, you and the audience that are prospective students or uh, admitted students, this is another example of the kind of research you're going to be able to perform when you join us in UT Dallas. Uh, Monica, um, we're very proud of you. Keep up that good work and keep, keep working hard. You have two PhDs, uh, two, two doctoral degrees to win. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No pressure, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, uh, Dean Gonzalez. We're going to head over to Dean Small. Mario, that was fabulous. Um, um, the getting, uh, getting at the basic mechanisms here, hearing loss is obviously really important. We can, uh, we can have all sorts of uh, um, um, therapies, but we need to have new therapies that are really helpful. In order to have new therapies that are really helpful, we have to understand the basic mechanisms, and that's really what you're doing. Um, the interesting thing right now, we're all becoming aware of testing. You know, everybody, you go to the TV, everybody talks about testing, and some tests have false positive rates, which means they're, say they're positive, but you're negative. Some tests have false negative rates. They say you're negative, but you're really positive. You have come up with a, um, a really interesting um, analysis of a test that's used all over the place mm -hmm. for inner hair cell loss that may not show inner hair cell loss. I think that's really a phenomenal finding. And the question is, I mean, it's a really, it could be a groundbreaking finding. The question is, the people who were using it, you know, it got approved and everything. People are basing their livelihoods on doing the acoustic reflex. Um, how is it that that acoustic reflex um, was was thought to measure inner hair cell loss when it looks like it doesn't. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the acoustic reflex, and I may not have been clear about this before, it's actually used for a couple different things. So not just to look at the inner hair cell, uh, but it has been suggested that it could be very sensitive to detecting some inner hair cell damage. Uh, so our results kind of blow that out of the water a little bit. Um, and certainly, like I said, we really want to take a closer look and perhaps look at more conditions and really, really parse it apart. But 
actually, uh, Dr. Charlie Lieberman at Harvard has suggested that after looking at our results, it's possible that the vestibular system, so our, our system of balance, plays a role in the acoustic reflex itself. So that is really interesting and, and could be a, a really strong uh, direction to move in the future. Really interesting. Let's move to Nicole. Nicole, would you like to add anything? Yes, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation um, and it thoroughly explaining your project, going through the poster, it really helped. And I also found it really interesting, um, you know, at the end you mentioned, you know, future therapies and future directions that this could go. And just great work. It was wonderful. It was very enjoyable. Thank you. Great job. So thank you again um, to Monica for an excellent presentation. And now you can see here, we're going to um, do our final poll. And so if you haven't done it yet, text UTD Research 004 to 37607 and you'll receive an auto response. So you have seen our five finalists battle it out with these excellent presentations about their work. So now you get to pick the winner of today's competition. So we've put the instruction for voting up on the screen. So you can see here's a review of our five finalists. We have Deborah Calderon, um, Adrian DeFroy, Robert Morrison, Olga Peskova, and Monica Trevino. So the um, instructions for voting are up on the screen. Again, get ready to vote. And let's see who you're casting your votes for. So who do you think presented their research the best? And here are your five contestants. So let's just see as the votes start coming in. Doing a great job. So we have some good representation here of everybody. So good. Everyone looking great. I love that you can see it's interactive. So this is as votes are coming in in real time. So good job to all of our contestants. Congratulations. You did a great job. We are so proud of you and all the excellent work that you're doing at UTD. So make sure you cast your votes. Every vote counts. So send in A for Deborah Calderon, B for Adrian DeFroy, C for Robert Morrison, D for Olga Peskova, and E for Monica Trevino. And again, just make sure that you are sending your text in. If you didn't get in just in time, um, if you haven't done that yet, make sure that you text UTD Research 004-237607, and then you can join um, and you can vote one time for Deborah, Adrian, Robert, Olga, or Monica. So who is it gonna be? It keeps shifting, which is really exciting. Can't wait to see who's gonna who's gonna be our final winner. But you guys are doing great. We're so proud of you. We're also proud of the audience for picking this up. So right now, I think, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna take a short commercial break, um, but the polls will still be open for a little bit longer. And then we'll tally the votes and we'll be back with Dean Small who will announce the winners. So keep on voting and here comes our commercial break. John actually passed his newborn hearing screen, um, but when he was a toddler, we started noticing he wasn't developing normal speech. And we went to see his pediatrician, we saw multiple doctors, and he started undergoing uh, evaluations and we finally got a diagnosis when he was about one year old that he had a severe to profound hearing loss and we were directed to Callier Center. I first met the McPhersons right after John had been identified with a hearing loss and they were trying to determine if a cochlear implant was appropriate for him. He was enrolled in therapy when he was fit with his hearing aids and from then we began trying to introduce sound into his world and then they determined that he wasn't receiving enough sound through the hearing aids, and so they recommended cochlear implants. And he ended up uh, getting his first cochlear implant when he was just a little after his first birthday, and his second cochlear implant when he was around four years old. We saw him initially when I was an extern, so my fourth year in the Doctor of Audiology program was here at the Callier Center, and so part of my clinical duties um, included cochlear implants and so I saw John initially um, and just kind of followed him through the years since then. So before he even got the cochlear implants he was doing auditory verbal speech therapy. When John first was diagnosed they told us that 
he would likely not develop normal speech and that we would probably end up communicating with him through sign language. He barely even could say any words, just a few words. My earliest memory was probably when I was in speech therapy with Melissa and we had this little monkey playset and we had to count all the monkeys on this little tree and the people there were always really kind to me. They kind of helped me out. I felt like they were on my side, kind of with me. John's communication skills progressed really well. By the time he was in kindergarten, he no longer required speech language therapy. So now we just get to see him come back annually, so we see big changes in him developmentally from year to year. He has developed normal speech. He is in the top of his class. He does really well. It's completely changed our life, our whole family. Each year, Callier hosts a summer listening camp for children with cochlear implants, and it's staffed with graduate students in speech pathology and audiology from UT Dallas. It's awesome as a clinician to be able to get out of the formal setting of clinic and really be able to see our kids flourish and further develop their speech and language skills while participating in all sorts of fun camp activities in the outdoors. And so I really enjoy spending a whole week with our kids and, and seeing them just have fun without realizing that they're receiving therapy as well. When I was little, I went to the cochlear implant camp. Uh, my first year I went was when I was four, uh, but now that I'm a teenager, I go back to volunteer. Just want to see some of the kids who are kind of like me, kind of help them grow, help them learn to communicate and have fun. Uh, but also I wanted to give them an example of what you can be and who you can become. And there's like no limit to having cochlear implants. Our cochlear implant program is one of the largest pediatric cochlear implant programs in the nation. To date, we've implanted more than 700 children. Being a part of UT Dallas and having our partners with UT Southwestern Medical Center and Children's Health really has provided um, a lot of patients access to services that they may not have received elsewhere. It's such a privilege for me to be part of a family's decision in pursuing a cochlear implant for their child and following that child's journey from little to no hearing to their cochlear implant surgery and initial activation of the cochlear implant, seeing their responses for the first time to voices and sounds, and really watching them develop in their hearing and speech language skills over time. It's very rewarding to see a child really flourish over time and become a young adult. Um, and have hopes and dreams for their future, partly because the cochlear implant provided them access to live a full and successful life. Seeing a child here for the first time is an amazing experience, but even more amazing is being able to walk along the side of families as they move through this journey of helping their child learn to understand the sounds around them. They helped us all along the way, and they continue to help us today, and it's been almost 17 years, and I, I can't believe it, but they've all been amazing, and I feel like I've gotten to know everyone here, from the audiologist to the speech therapists, everyone, and it's, it's just been an amazing experience, and they're all so helpful, so friendly, and so knowledgeable. The Keller Center impacted my life by providing me the opportunity to learn to listen and talk and communicate with others uh, in an effective way. And I feel like that really shaped my life. Callier's just been amazing and has changed our family for the better. I'm so excited to announce that we finished counting the votes and Dean Small is ready to announce the winners of today's Research Showcase poster competition. So take it away, Dean Small. Extremely uh, proud to announce the, the winners. Um, as, as everyone knows already, um, we have five winners. You all are winners. Everyone gets a dinner around the town, um, <laughs> of, of the town, quote unquote, because <laughs> we don't have a lot of town to go to right now. Uh, you got a dinner on the takeout. But anyway, so um, uh, congratulations to all five of you. Um, Honorable mentions, uh, we have two honorable mentions um, and those go to um, Monica Trevino and Robert Morrison are our uh, two honorable mentions. So congratulations and you get a cash prize uh, for, for uh, being in the final round and we appreciate it very much. 
the um, the third place winner um, this year, bronze bronze finalist, um, goes to uh, Olga Peskova, um, and we want to give Olga a, a round of applause. Um, congratulations, Olga! Um, you know, fabulous fabulous work on all five of you guys. Actually, <laughs> the uh, the silver medal, the silver prize uh, goes to. What? I want to have a drum roll. Somebody make a drum roll. Okay, uh, Adrienne Defroy. Uh, gets the uh, uh, the silver medal, the the uh, um, second place, and th that means there's one person who already knows what she got, which is Deborah Calderon, who won the first place gold medal uh, prize. But um, the I saw, you know, you saw the initial votes, and I saw the final votes, and this was a close call. You guys are fabulous. You guys are great. Um, and uh, uh, thank, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Gonzalez, who runs the PhD programs around the whole university. Um, Dr. Pancrazio, who runs the Office of Research, who sponsored this whole thing, uh, just did a fabulous job, organized it. Um, and Suzanne and Danny and the whole team over in the uh, the Office of Research uh, did a great job, but congratulations to, to everybody's fabulous research. I loved hearing about it. I love learning about it. Um, I love reading about all the, I read about these the last couple of days. <laughs> They're really interesting topics. So congratulations, everybody. So thank you, Dean Small, for announcing our winners. And like you said, we have five winners here, so super exciting. Congratulations to our overall winner, Deborah Calderon, and again to all of the finalists who participated today. We are so proud of you and loved hearing about you share your enthusiasm for your work, and we expect great things um, from you in the future. And thank you again to our audience. You did a lot of work too. You had to figure out how to do Poll Anywhere and you're the ones who picked our winner. So thank you so much for participating and also to our production crew for all of your hard work. Just so you know, the production crew spent hours upon hours putting everything together and making this a seamless show for all of you. We will see you again in the late fall for another research showcase poster competition this time showcasing the hard work of another school at the University of Texas at Dallas, the School of Economics, Political and Policy Sciences. Thank you so much. Have a great day and stay safe. Bye.